Hi everybody and welcome to another video in the Deep Learning for Audio with Python series. This time we're going to build a music genre classifier using a multi-layer perception network. Cool. So music genre classification is a type of problem that's called a classification problem, right? So what's a classification problem? Well, classification problem is I have uh, a bunch of data and I want to classify that. So I have, for example, like a bunch of uh, tracks and I want to classify them into like rock music, uh, blues music or like classical music. Specifically, what we're doing today is called multi-class classification. So we have a bunch of tracks and those vinyls <laughs> would uh, want to like represent those tracks and then we want to classify them into a bunch of different genres, right? So it could be classical, it could be death metal, it could be EDM and whatever, right? But it's more than two and multi-class classification is opposed to binary classification where we just have two categories out there. So for example, it could be uh, tell me uh, whether like this track is classical or is not classical, right? Cool. Okay, so with this in mind, uh, let's get started like building like the classifier. And uh, obviously we are going to build uh, like on top of the work that we've done in the uh, previous video, where we actually created a, a data set out of like the Marseilles uh, song data set, which is divided into a bunch of different genres, 10 genres to be specific. And there, what we did uh, was building a JSON file, so we can see it here, uh, where uh, we just extracted uh, like all the different uh, genres and mapped them. Uh, we extracted the labels and uh, then we also extracted the MFCC. So we have like both the inputs and outputs. So the inputs and the labels or targets for our network. So what we want to do as a first step here in our um, uh, genre classifier is load the data set, load data. Then once we've done that, we want to uh, split the data into uh, training, train, and uh, test sets. Then using TensorFlow and Keras specifically, we're gonna build the network architecture. Then we want to compile uh, network and finally we want to train the network right okay so let's get started from the first phase which is loading data and so for doing that we'll uh, create a function which we'll call <laughs> not surprisingly load data and this function uh, accepts one argument and the argument is the uh, data set uh, path Right. Okay, so we have the data set path here. Uh, and uh, now what we want to do is like load uh, like this data. And we know that uh, like this data is stored in a JSON file. And so as the first thing, we want to uh, open uh, and read from this JSON file. And so we'll do a with open and uh, we'll pass in the uh, data set path and we'll open it uh, as um, oops, here I should say like the, the mode that we want to read this, uh, we want to like open uh, this file for and we'll put an R here which stands for read, so we're opening for reading and we'll do as AFP and then down here we'll do a data, it's equal to json.load and uh, we'll pass in FP. Now, JSON uh, obviously like is a uh, Python uh, module, so we have to import it. And so we'll do an import JSON. And here in this data, we've, we're basically loading all of this huge uh, dictionary here with mapping, labels, and MFCC. Cool. Okay, so once we have that, we want to do uh, another thing. So we want to convert uh, NumPy arrays into, oh, sorry, <laughs> it's actually the opposite. So convert lists into uh, NumPy arrays. 
So, and that's because both the, uh, the labels, like for example here, and the MFCCs, uh, these guys here, are stored and will be retrieved as lists. And so we want to convert them uh, into NumPy arrays. And so first of all, let's import uh, NumPy as NP. And then what we want to do here is say, okay, so here I want the inputs, right? And so, and the inputs are equal to np dot uh, array, and we want to pass in the um, here we want to pass in the the MFCC, and so we'll do data, and here we have this MFCC, and uh, then we can do a similar thing for the targets or like the expected outcomes, but instead of the MFCC. Here we'll have the uh, labels, right? Okay, and so what we want to do in the end is just passing the inputs and the targets out. And so this is all we need to load data. Well, so let's try this. So let's uh, create if uh, name is equal to main. And then what we want to do here is just like get the inputs and the targets and we'll get them by loading data. Now we actually need the data set path. And so I'm going to, uh, oops, not that. I'm going to create a uh, constant over here and I'll call uh, the this guy here, right? So this is the path to the data set. Right, so now as you notice, uh, you can notice here, so I saved this um, data set, <clears throat> this JSON file as data underscore 10 dot JSON. So uh, if you remember, so the Marseille's data set has a thousand um, 30 second excer excerpts of like songs divided into 10 genres. Now, uh, we said that that last time uh, we mentioned that that is not really like that much like for training a deep learning system so what it did was like segmenting those into uh like 10 different segments and so this is why i have this data 10. so all of a sudden now we have 10 000, uh, tr uh like the data set has 10 000, uh like tracks and each track uh, should be like three second long right okay so now we have our data set path and we need to pass it in here. Cool. Okay, so yeah, let me just do this so that it makes more sense. Okay, so uh, this way we should be able like, to uh, get the inputs and the targets and these are like NumPy uh, arrays. Right, now the next step that we want to perform is that of like splitting our data into train set and uh, test set. And that's because we don't want to um, evaluate our classifier on the training data because uh, otherwise it would be basically like cheating. So we want to evaluate on some uh, data that the classifier has never seen before. So for doing that, uh, we should uh, import um, a, a function from scikit-learn and this function is in the model selection uh, module and uh, we should say uh, whoop yeah this should be from uh, scikit-learn dot model selection imports and uh, this is train task split this is like a very nice uh, function we can use for this purpose. So here what we should do is say inputs and we'll do a, an inputs train and we'll do inputs a test then we'll do a targets train and a targets a test and then we'll use the train test split and here we need to pass three arguments. So obviously we need to pass in the uh, inputs that we've derived from the JSON file, the targets, and finally we want to specify the uh, test size. Uh, well, this is probably a little bit like difficult to read, so I'll do it like this. So here uh, in the test size uh, we could uh, 0.3. So basically what I'm saying here is that 30% of uh, this data is going to be used for uh, the test set, right? 
and the remaining 70% for uh, the train set. Cool. Okay, so now we have our own um, uh, our, our own uh, train set and uh, test set, right? And so the next step is that of building the network architecture. For doing that, obviously, we are going to need a TensorFlow. And then specifically, uh, we want uh, Keras. So we'll do an import TensorFlow dot Keras is Keras. So by now, guys, you should be like familiar with this. Now, uh, we uh, should build the model and the model is going to be a sequential model. So we'll do a Keras dot uh, sequential. And here uh, we should specify all the different uh, layers that we want in the network, right? And I'm thinking of using a, uh, let's say like an input layer, three hidden layers and an output layer. And given we are working with a simple multi-layer perception, I'm gonna be using all uh, fully connected or dense layers. Now, if you don't remember what a multi-layer perception is, don't worry, just go back here. You have like the description, like of one of my videos, it should be like in uh, the top side over here. So click there if you want to learn more about the theory about MLPs. Otherwise, let's move on. So the first thing that we want to do is the input uh, layer. So now for the input layer, we want to uh, uh, use a layer that's called uh, like flatten. So what flatten uh, does it basically takes a, a multi-dimensional array and it flattens it, it out, right? So in this case, so we expect for uh, the input shape uh, to be of type uh, inputs dot uh, shape. And here we'll pass in a one and then we'll do yeah, same thing here, but then we'll pass in two. Right, so basically what, what I'm saying here is that I want to flatten this two-dimensional uh, array, which is uh, like the, uh, the input uh, that we have here. And why is it two-dimensional? Well, because if you remember, we have MFCCs here for each uh, segment, for each track. And for each track, we have many MFCC vectors and each MFCC vector is taken at a specific interval. So, and that is like the hop length. Again, if you don't remember like what MFCCs are or uh, how we calculate them, uh, I have a video about that, go watch that out. Cool. But here, like in this two dimensional um, array, so we have like the, the, f the, 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 the first uh, like dimension, uh, which is basically uh, given by the uh, intervals, right? And the second uh, dimension is the values of the MFCCs uh, like in, for that interval. And in this case, we have 13 MFCCs. That's like the number that I've decided to extract, but I could have done more, 40, 30, whatever, really doesn't matter. Right, now you may be wondering, but how, why are you uh, passing in input.shape1? Why aren't you starting from index zero? Well, because inputs, actually, this guy here, is a three-dimensional array, and index zero represents like the different segments. So this is the uh, input layer. So now we should uh, move on and uh, work with the first, work out the first hidden layer. And so uh, this is going to be a simple uh, dense uh, layer. And here, uh, what we're going to do is say uh, how many neurons we want. And we'll start with 512 uh, neurons. And then we should specify which type of activation we want. And now, up until now, we've always used the sigma function, but this time, I want to introduce you a new type of activation function that's called ReLU. Now, ReLU is very, very important and, and very, very effective in deep learning, so it warrants some theoretical background. So let's move on to the PDF over here to the slide presentation. 
Uh, right, so we have the binary classification. So here we have the rectified linear unit or ReLU. So this is like this function. So And as you can see it here, so ReLU is a function of H. And if you recall from our theoretical uh, videos on um, uh, computation in neural networks, H is the net input, right? And so if H uh, is, my, uh, is less than zero, then ReLU outputs zero. If H is uh, greater or equal, equal or greater than zero, then H uh, basically uh, is used uh, as an output for ReLU. So ReLU it's e equal to H. And so this is like the, uh, the plots that we have for ReLU. Now you may be wondering, but why should we care about a rectified linear unit? Can't we just use the sigmoid uh, function? So it's very nice, like we, we are familiar with that. Why using ReLU? Well, it turns out that ReLU is very, very effective for uh, training. So it, uh, when compared with uh, the sigmoid function, it enables us to train a network way faster. So it enables to have like better convergence of the network. And one of the reasons why this is the case, it's because ReLU reduces the uh, probability of having the so-called vanishing gradient. Now, <laughs> the vanishing gradient sounds like a scary thing. And indeed, uh, like it is for training purposes. But what is that? Well. So if you remember from our video on backpropagation, so what happens like uh, when we train a network is that we uh, basically backpropagate uh, the error from the output layer towards like the input layer, right? And so, and that happens at each hidden layer going back from output to input. Now, every time we, we have a new uh, a layer and we want to propagate the error to uh, a, a, a layer towards like the left, towards the beginning, towards the inputs. Uh, what happens is that we multiply uh, uh, like this value like by the uh, derivative of the activation function. And what happens with the sigmoid function is that the derivative of the sigmoid function at most can be 0.25, which basically means if you keep multiplying there, like the values that you are getting, like the errors that you're propagating are getting like smaller and smaller and smaller until they vanish. And so basically the gradient is vanishing. And if the gradient is like very, very small, then it's very difficult like, to train a network. Now with ReLU, we avoid all of these issues, which basically means we can have uh, um, architectures, like network architectures that are super complex with many, many uh, layers. But in the end, we're not going to have an issue of vanishing gradient. Whereas if we used a sigmoid function, we would have that issue, right? And so this is the beauty of rectified linear unit or ReLU. So let's go back to the code now. Cool. Okay, so this was just like the first hidden layer. So we said that we want other two hidden layers. And so what we'll do uh, is just like copy these guys a couple of times. But now you can see that I made a mistake that I make like all the times, no matter how much time I spend with this stuff. So I sometimes forget like to add commas. Right. Okay, so here we have the second hidden layer and here we have the third hidden layer. Now, uh, here let's say that we want 256 neurons and here let's say we want 64 neurons, right? So now the last thing that remains to do to build uh, this network is to create the output uh, layer. And so again, uh, this is uh, another uh, dense layer but here uh, we are going to use 10 neurons. And why are we using 10 neurons? Well, because we have 10 categories, which are like the 10 uh, genres that we want to uh, split, like our uh, predict our data set into. And it's these guys here. So if we go to the uh, data uh, JSON file, so it's these guys here. So disco, reggae, rock, pop, blues, country, and so on and so forth. Cool. So we have like this 10 um, neurons. 
And then we use uh, as the activation, we use a soft max. <laughs> Again, I forgot to put in the comma over there. Right. Okay. So, so what's soft max? Well, soft max is a um, an activation function that basically enables us to have. So, if you sum the values associated to all the ten neurons here, all the the output neurons, you're gonna get one. It basically normalizes like the output for us, and then. When we do predictions, so we predict, so we, we pick the neuron that has the highest uh, value and that represents the category like we are uh, predicting. Cool. So uh, with this, we built our network architecture. So now we need to move on to the next phase, which is uh, compiling uh, the network. So if you guys remember, the first thing that we want to do here is to uh, decide which optimizer we want to use, right? And here uh, we are gonna use Adam. So, and let's specify the learning rate here and we could say 0 0.0001, okay, cool. So uh, Adam is a an optimizer that it's, basically like a an extension like a variation of like a uh, stochastic gradient descent and it's very very effective uh, with deep learning so we're going to use this then the next step that we want to do is a model dot uh, compile and here uh, we should pass in uh, a few uh, things right so yeah let's start with the uh, optimizer so the optimizer, we pass in our optimizer, uh, which is Adam. So then uh, we need to decide uh, which uh, loss function uh, we want to use or error function we want to use. And uh, for this problem, which is a uh, multi-class classification problem, we are going to use sparse categorical uh, cross entropy. Right. And uh, finally, we can specify like the, the metrics that we want to track. And here we could say uh, accuracy, right? Okay, so this way we've basically compiled uh, our uh, network. So a nice thing we could do here is a model dot summary, uh, which basically will give us like a print of uh, a kind of like a summary of the architecture of the network, specify the number of parameters we have, the layers. It's it's a nice thing like to have when you when you train uh, like this stuff. Okay, so let me just like move this thing up. Okay, so the final thing that remains to do here is uh, training the network. So how do we do that? Well, we've done this like before, and it can't be much easier than this. So and it's basically doing a model. Uh, dot fit and now we need to pass in the input strain the um uh, here we need the target strain so we are basically passing the the uh inputs and targets for uh, the the training split and then we'll do a validation data so this is basically like our uh testing uh, uh, uh data set that we want to pass in and uh, here we'll, we'll pass in the inputs test and uh, where is it? It's the targets test. Now, yeah, this is becoming a little bit inconvenient to uh, follow. So I'll just like do new lines here. Uh, right. Uh, so the other stuff that we want to specify is the number of epochs and yeah we could say yeah we'll have like 50 epochs here and finally we'll specify the batch size and we'll put this like to 32. Now you may be wondering but what's the batch size? Well this is like something very very important and for that reason we're gonna take a look at this like in our slide presentation over here. Right, there are a bunch of different types of uh, batching, which is basically like the way like we, we train like our network. 
So in a previous video uh, on backpropagation, we and uh, gra um, stochastic gradient descent, we, we, we looked at a type of batching, which is called like stochastic. So in this case, with st stochastic, for example, stochastic gradient descent, what you do is you uh, calculate the gradient after you've considered just like one sample. So just one segment of our uh, like tracks, right? So you, you do a fit forward and then you do a back propagation there. Uh, you calculate the gradient and you update uh, the weights directly. This is like very quick to perform, but it's kind of like very, very inaccurate because like there's a lot of noise. And this would basically be equal to having like the batch size over here equal to one, right? Uh, now uh, we have like the, the opposite, which is basically <laughs> you consider the the full batch so the, you compute uh, the gradient so you, you update the weights on the whole training set so you pass in the whole training set and only at that point uh, you, you you calculate uh, the gradient uh, this is <laughs> problematic for deep learning because like we have usually huge huge data sets so this results in something that's super slow, it's super memory intensive and for all purposes and needs, like it's actually impractical. But the great thing about this is that it's actually very accurate, right? Because we are calculating the gradient on many, many uh, samples, on the whole samples, right? And for full batch, you basically have uh, one uh, pass, which is uh, just like one epoch, because we're passing the whole uh, training set through uh, the network for training purposes. Now, there's a middle ground there, and it's called a mini batch. And here the idea is to basically compute the gradient on a subset of the data set, right? And we can consider like 16, 32, 64 like samples. And then once we've considered those, we can actually calculate the gradient uh, at that point. And then, yeah, back propagate the error and, uh, and update the weights. And so we're doing training on, on uh, like some uh, like mini batches, right? Okay. So in this, uh, with mini batch, usually you would use like from 16 to 128 samples, but then this is by no means like a universal rule, rather uh, it just like depends on the type of problem that you are tackling, right? And the great thing about mini batch is that it's really like the best of the two worlds. Like it's kind of like relatively, uh, yeah, it's quick. It's not that memory intensive and it's quite accurate. So. This is like the solution that we use like in deep, in deep learning like the most. So now let's go back to the code, right? So this batch size, it's basically uh, specifying the number of like samples that we want in our batch for uh, before like we, we, we calculate the gradient, right? And with first two, this is like a quite customary uh, like value as I was mentioning. Cool. Well, I think like we, we are basically done here, right? So we so just like to uh, review all of this. So we load the data, we split the data into training and uh, test sets. We built we built uh, like our network architecture. We've compiled the network. We we have a nice model summary here, and now we are ready to train the network. So now, if there are uh, no mistakes in my code, which I hope <laughs> it's the case we should be able to train the network. So let's run the script and see what happens. Okay, so it's taking a little bit of time because obviously like it's uh, loading uh, the data there. So let's see. Yeah, here we go. Okay, it's working. So here, as you see, we have the, the model summary and we have like this flatten over here, then we have the dense layer and here we have the associated number of parameters and here, yeah, it's a nice thing like to have like overall. So now uh, here, as you see, we are tracking uh, the, the different epochs over here. And here like we get like an output which, which gives us for each epoch the accuracy on the training set and the accuracy on uh, on uh, the test set. You, you 
you, you might start uh, like and also like the the loss like for the uh, training set and for like this uh, test set. So you maybe start seeing uh, an issue uh, like arising here. So take a look at the accuracy. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like yeah. So let's wait like for this like to uh, to end to finish. Uh, before like we comment on that because like every time I can move this uh, yeah there's a new epoch and it gets just like uh, yeah move back like to to uh, yeah to the start point well right but we are done so let's take a look at the accuracy so here it's after 50 epochs so uh, here we have the loss for uh, like the uh, calculated on the training set which is like quite low. And here we have the accuracy, which is fantastic. Well, we have almost like 97% accuracy, which is incredibly good. But is it really that good? Let's take a look at the <laughs> at the accuracy and the loss calculated on the um, a test set. Well, it turns out that there's a huge difference between this accuracy on the test set and the accuracy on the training set. Well, it's basically almost like 30% uh, percent different. Uh, well, uh, uh, 89, well, it's, it's more. It's more, it's almost like 40% uh, like difference there, which is incredible, right? So what's happening here? So we have like the, the training, uh, like the, the model performing extremely well, like on the training data, but performing not that great, like on the um, uh, on the test set. Uh, why, why, why is that the case? Well, it turns out we are overfitting. So basically, what's happening is that we are so like the model is tailoring uh, its weights in order to predict. Uh, uh, in a very like compelling way, uh, the uh, the test set, but it's not really that able to generalize to data it has never seen before. So this is a huge, huge problem. And every time you do any type of machine learning, not just deep learning, this is something you have to fight against overfitting. Now, so in the next video, we are gonna look at how to uh, identify uh, like overfitting like in our um, models and how to fight against overfitting. So we're gonna see a bunch of different uh, techniques that we can use like dropouts or um, regularization, uh, just like to, to avoid uh, overfitting, right? But for now, for this video, we are basically done and you should be like super happy because now we have a music genre classifier and it's not like the best classifier ever. And we still have to solve overfitting, but here we have really all the fundamentals of our music genre classifier. Great. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. If that's so, Remember to subscribe and uh, hit the notification bell so you'll never miss a new video when I upload them. And if you have any questions, please like leave a comment uh, below. And as always, I'll hope to see you next time. Cheers.